This morning I had the privilege of uh, speaking at Stephen's Church over in Hastings and, and had a lovely time fellowshipping with them and they send their, their love and best wishes, um, so that's from the Unitarian Church in Hastings. Thank you. Would you pray with me please? Holy loving God, for the many gifts that you give us, we give you thanks and praise and honour and glory and ask that in this moment that it be your presence that touches us, and it be your hand that reaches out and stirs within us, so that we hear words that are not just ones that come from my lips, but are words from you to touch our hearts. Give us ears to listen, minds open to receive, and hearts willing to take on the love that you offer. And we ask this, Jesus, in your holy name. Amen. Amen. So, when I first came along to MCC, which was in the early 90s, I remember that I was completely overwhelmed by this feeling of belonging, of knowing that I had a place to call home, and it was somewhere that I could just be myself. And I threw myself into ministry alongside some marvellous people, uh, Robert, of course, Robert was one, Robert, one of them, Nigel, not here, was another, and, and, um, and I had a, an amazing time, and when Troy came to the UK, Troy Perry, he was there on a tour of churches raising funds so that we could build our first um, central building in, in LA, um, I volunteered to be his chauffeur, and um, the reasons were because I, I had some holiday from work, so I had some time on my hands, um, but also I worked for Philips, which meant I had a company car, and they paid all the petrol, drivers <laughs> as well, so it was a no-brainer, I got to be the chauffeur, and, and I became somewhat enamoured of Troy. You see, on the one hand, he was this really deeply spiritual and charismatic man, Certainly a man of God, but on the other hand, he was a very openly gay man, and I can remember driving along, and much to the horror of the other occupants of the car, I told him a really bad taste joke, one that I won't repeat here, and he gave me back one that was just as bad, and I was absolutely thrilled, because I wasn't doing it to shock him, I was doing it to see whether he was real, and he was, and that's what really attracted me. So. When they had this benefit in New York for Troy, um, I wrote this little piece called um, Jesus and the Care Bear. Um, and since it's Interfaith Month, I would like to share it with you. It, it kind of goes like this. So it's set in heaven, and they're having a meeting, and Jesus, as the meeting's chair, brings the group to order. As you know, he says, Peter's been responsible for the gates of heaven for 2,000 years now, and he's decided that time has come to pursue new interests in the commonwealth of God. And as a result, we are today going to appoint a new gatekeeper. There were gasps from some quarters and murmurs from others, and Jesus smiled and said, This is, as always, an open table. Let me hear your recommendations. So the Catholics rose. And they spoke, as long as no one's admitted who's used condoms or had an abortion, then we approve your choice, Jesus. And then the Baptist rose and spoke and said, as long as no one enters who's not been baptized, then we approve your choice, Jesus. The Buddhist rose and said, as long as those who enter have achieved enlightenment, then, then we approve of your choice. And then the Hindus rose and said, as long as they have experienced life in all of its forms, in all of its richness, then we approve of your choice. And the Jews rose and said, as long as they've kept the commandments, then we approve of your choice, Jesus. And the evangelicals rose and said, as long as they believe our interpretation of the Bible, then we approve of your choice, Jesus. And on and on it went with each group having a voice, 
each group laying down terms, each group claiming their own individual right to heaven. Then after some time, after all the voices had spoken, Jesus rose and spoke and said, well, it's with some personal pride that I announce to you that I have chosen a new guardian for the gates of heaven. Peter will continue to work in his role until such a time as the new candidate's willing to accept the post. And for the post of gatekeeper for the doors of heaven, I choose Reverend Elder Troy Perry from MCC. I told you I was enamored. So a stunned silence settled over the assembly as one elderly and red-faced delegate struggled to their feet and said, but Jesus, my God, he let everybody in. And Jesus smiled and said, exactly, meeting adjourned, thank you. <laughs> and, and for me, it's a lovely idea that God is great enough to save everyone. Now, personally, I could never work out how God could be almighty if God didn't save everyone. See, I believe that all things are possible for God. And even Jesus talks about those who are different to us, even unknown to us, making the cut into heaven. In John 10, 16, Jesus says, There are sheep which belong to me that are not of this fold. I must bring them too. They'll listen to my voice and they'll become one flock with one shepherd. And I always wondered, who are these other sheep that Jesus is talking about? Are they, are they perhaps Gentiles? I mean, after all, Jesus is talking to a mainly Jewish group. Or are they the ones that society has abandoned? The disabled, the queer, the outcast? I mean, after all, he constantly reached out to those that were on the margins. Are they perhaps the Buddhists, the Hindus, the Hellenists, those that practice the Roman religion? After all, the Apostle Paul uses the Greek temple to the unknown God as a way of introducing Christianity to Athens. Is Jesus doing something similar here? Truth is, I don't know. And it could be any of these. And if you have a look online, and if you're going to waste some time, do so, then you'll find rationales for all of these and many, many more. But I suppose the big question is, could other religions be the truth? just as Christianity is the truth? Could they be the way, just as Christianity is the way? Could you find your salvation in some other faith, just as we do in the Christian faith? Of course, some people think that just asking the question is the ultimate blasphemy. But for some, the thought that another faith might bring salvation is absolute nonsense, especially those who don't even believe that a different denomination can bring you salvation, <laughs> never mind a different faith. You know, when, when Quentin Crisp visited Northern Ireland, he was at a meeting and he told them that he was an atheist, and a woman in the audience stood up and said, okay, but is it the God of the Catholics or the God of the Protestants that you don't believe in? <laughs> you see, I know that I can be saved through accepting Jesus as Lord. But whether another route can lead you to the same place, I have no idea. I know what it is to be Christian. I have decades of experience, but I have no experience in what it is to be a Buddhist or a Hindu or a Muslim or a follower of any other faith. You know, and I love the new openness that you can often find in, in much of the Christian church today. And if you studied the Phoenix affirmations with us, then, then you'll know what I'm talking about. So perhaps, just like the oceans are one, yet the Caribbean is very different to the Atlantic, or which is different to the Mediterranean, or the Adriatic, or the Pacific, maybe religions are all very different, but part of one thing. Lots of seas, but one ocean. Maybe they all lead you to the same place. Again, I don't know. I know where this path leads. I don't know where that path leads. And if I never walk it, how could I possibly assume to know where it leads? So what do we do? <clears throat> do we study them all? Do we get experience of all the faiths? I mean, if, rich, if religions are like oceans, should we sail every one? I love that metaphor. Um, <laughs> but in reality, you know, life's not long enough to do that. <laughs> you couldn't do it with all the Christian denominations, never mind all the different religions and all of their permutations too, you'd never get to explore them all deeply enough to know the real truth. And I believe that if you really want to know what a religion is about, then you've really got to get beneath the waves and you've got to swim in the deep water. 
You see, you could be a Christian by believing in Jesus, reading the Bible, coming to church. But as Garrison Keller said, anyone who thinks that sitting in church can make you a Christian must also think that sitting in a garage can make you a car. <laughs> to really follow Jesus, you've got to get out of the shallows and into the deep water. And in my experience, you do that through reading, through fellowship, and through worship. Let me say a little bit about each three. Firstly, reading. You know, Charlie Jones is quoted as saying, you'll be the same person in five years that you are today, except for the people that you meet and the books that you read. And in my experience, he is absolutely right. Although, if you read lots and lots of books in the hope of finding some ultimate answer, then in my experience, you're onto a hiding for nothing. I'd recommend that if you're an avid reader, that you include one book about your faith a month. And if you're not an avid reader, then perhaps one a quarter in your monthly selection. See, the temptation is to cram, like you're studying for an exam, you know, read a lot, learn as much as you possibly can. But <coughs> when you're reading about faith, the downtime is actually just as important, in fact more important, than the reading time. If you swamp your mind, then your unconscious won't be able to sort out what to accept and what to reject. It all just becomes so much noise and your mind just ends up sorting information into categories rather than checking it against day-to-day -day experience and allowing the relevant bits to change us. Now, you know, for centuries, the Roman Catholic Church banned ordinary people from reading the Bible. Now, I suspect that part of their reasoning was it kept power in the hands of the priests. But I think another reason is that if you don't understand what you're reading, the Bible can really mess you up. You see, if you take Genesis literally, or Paul's letters as gospel teaching, or books of prophecy as some kind of holy fortune telling, then you totally miss the importance of myth and legend, or the personal nature of Paul's experience and the mistakes he made or reading prophecy as protest literature or social reality checks. See, starting to read the Bible at Genesis and ending at Revelation is like going into your local library, starting at A and reading every book until you end up at Z and expecting them to fit together into some kind of cohesive story. <laughs> See, the Bible is a library of 66 books by various authors and different types of literature. It's not J.K. JK Rowling's Harry Potter. So, yes, reading is important, but choose the books carefully. Is the author well recommended by people that you trust? Is it something that you're working on? Do the people who recommended the book and the writer have the fruit to match the tree? What about the lens through which they see the world? Are they justifying a certain view? or exploring possibilities? Does it give you the facts, or does it give you ideas to ponder? You know, sometimes I've read something, and it's hit me like a ton of bricks, and the whole world changes. But more likely than not, the book just kind of settles into my psyche until eventually my mind decides what fits and what doesn't, what's useful and what's not. And it's amazing how many times I've gone back to reread a book to find an idea that I thought was my own and actually was from that book. In fact, when we read the Phoenix Affirmations, there was a couple in there I was like, oh, that's where I got it from. I thought that was mine. But, um, but that's, and that's why those books are important. So reading is important. <clears throat> and then fellowship is important. And I'm not talking about a day out, although that's certainly nice and that is important in its own right. I'm talking about Having a conversation with someone where it's safe to be yourself. Having a conversation with someone where it's safe to be wrong. You know, the amount of times that I've said something because it's what I've always said, just to suddenly realize that actually once it's out of my mouth that I don't believe that anymore. And I didn't even realize that I changed my mind until the words were out of my mouth. It's really important that you're with people that you trust when that happens. Do you believe the Bible is the word of God? Yep, 
That's what I was brought up to believe. Oh, hang on a minute. Sorry, actually when I think about it, I don't believe the Bible is the Word of God. I actually believe that Jesus is the Word of God and the Bible is inspired of God. And they're two very different things. Now, fellowship is about having a space where it's okay to get something wrong or to change our mind. It's a safe space. And actually, this is really difficult to grasp because for a lot of us, church was the very least safe space in which to explore our faith. This was the one place where you didn't get to say what you really thought or believed or felt. Because instead of a place of forgiveness where it's safe to be ourselves, it was often a place of judgment. That certainly was my experience when I was younger. I want you to know that there's absolutely nothing that you can't come to me and talk to me about. Except sports and TV soaps. <laughs> Apart from that, you could. So the last one's worship. And, of course, I'm talking about here on a Sunday, but I'm also talking about during the week. You see, for me, worship is more than just this. Worship is when I talk to God and I'm driving along. Worship is when I'm chatting with God and exploring my day or sharing what's happened or expressing gratitude. Gratitude is really important. In fact, it's interesting that if you explore all of the major religions, they all have gratitude as one of their core premises somewhere. And how often, how long do you think it would take you to think of a hundred things that you're grateful for? And I sat and wrote this, and it's easier than you think. I think I did this in about five minutes. So, grateful for the sunset, for the birds, for my car, for my hair, not this hair. your lover, my lover, my favorite TV program, for that great song I've just heard, uh, for someone's kind word, uh, for the food that I eat, for my friends, for my health, uh, whatever state it's in, uh, for the book I just read, for the night out I had, for the prescription I just picked up from the chemist, for my phone, for my cup of tea, for my teeth, for my chocolate, for my ice cream, I got into food then, Simon's delicious cakes, and then I went to the church for the church, for the day centre we meet in, for the programme, or for the songbook in your hand, the one that, that Will put together, and Will's beautiful music, and that's 25, and I didn't even have to try. See, gratitude opens the heart to God. And the one thing God can't resist is an open heart. If you want some ideas, then try reading a psalm a day. They're only short. For example, Psalm 56, 16 to 17. You do not want sacrifices, or I would offer them. You're not pleased with burnt offerings. My sacrifice is a humble spirit, O oh God. You will not reject a humble and repentant heart. Eckhart Tolle wrote that acknowledging the good you already have in your life is the foundation for all abundance. Melody Beattie said that gratitude turns what we have into enough and more. It turns denial into acceptance, chaos into order, confusion into clarity. It makes sense of our past, brings peace for today and creates a vision for tomorrow. And then in 1 Thessalonians 5, 15 to 18, the Apostle Paul wrote, Be joyful always, pray at all times, be thankful in all circumstances. This is what God wants from you in your life in union with Christ Jesus. You see, gratitude and worship, for me, are actually the same thing. Gratitude is the key to the heart. And if you want to let God in, then you open the door. And if... You've read a few psalms, and you can't think of anything to be grateful for, then actually the Buddha had some really good advice. The Buddha said, let us rise up and be thankful. For if we didn't learn a lot today, at least we learned a little. And if we didn't learn a little, at least we didn't get sick. And if we got sick, at least we didn't die. So let's all be thankful. <laughs> Which I think kind of brings us back to where we started, because gratitude, as I said, is at the heart of all the great religions, as is fellowship and education. But before you're going off, before you go off to explore them all, swim deep in the faith that you already have. In my experience, the deeper you swim in your own faith, the easier it becomes to connect with those who are swimming deep in theirs. And then you'll find that actually, you've probably got more in common than you ever thought. Amen. Amen.